Okay, good evening, everybody. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Before we get started, I just have a couple of announcements that I want to share with you. Uh, instead of me making an announcement about all the workshops that are coming up, I decided just to put this little fact sheet together, <laughs> okay, because we have so many of them starting right now, it's unbelievable. There's actually five of them starting. So if you need more information about the workshops that are coming up, uh, please, um, at the front desk on your way out, the actual flyers themselves are on the front desk. You can pick them up, okay? So it gives you an idea of what's coming up anyway, okay? So that saves me making 25 announcements. I also want to mention the fact that if you go to our website or the lecture schedules and things are out there, to this week and next week, we'll be finishing up the series on grief and loss, and then I'll be starting the nine-week series on codependency. Okay, so those things are out there that are in the schedule. You can check them out if you want to, okay? All right. I also want to mention, people asked me this question, so I want to answer it. People want to know when the series I did on addiction is going to go on YouTube. I talked to the guy who does this, and they're going to take the grief loss ones and the ones from addiction and put them all on at the same time. Okay, so basically we'll be doing in that direction. Okay, so this week and next week, and the, not, the nine codependency lectures are already on the website. You can check them out, okay? Got that down now? Okay, good. All right. How you doing, huh? I'm going to begin tonight by doing the reading from the language of letting go. You want to pass that around for me? I picked the reading from November the 1st, because we're talking about the grief series. Transformation through grief. We're striving for acceptance and recovery. Acceptance of ourselves, our past, other people, and our present circumstances. Acceptance brings peace, healing, and freedom. And freedom is to take care of ourselves. Acceptance is not a one-step process. Before we achieve acceptance, we go through its stages of denial, anger, negotiating, and sadness. We call these stages the grief process. Grief can be frustrating. It can be confusing. We may go back and forth between sadness and denial. Our behaviors may change. Others may not understand us. We neither understand ourselves nor our own behavior while we're grieving our losses. Then one day, things become clear. The fog lifts, and we see that we have been struggling to face and accept a particular reality. Don't worry. If we are taking the steps to take care of ourselves, we will move through this process exactly at the right pace. Be understanding with yourself and others for the very human way we all go through transition. They will accept my way as I go through change. I will accept the grief process and the stages as the way people accept loss and change. Okay. I wanted to read that tonight because what I want to do tonight and next week is I started last week by talking about the overall concept of the grieving process. And I mentioned two things which are really important. I mentioned the fact that the grieving process fundamentally is referred to as the process of life. It's something we all go through on a daily basis. Not only in the death of someone, but any kind of change we make in the course of our journey. Going from one lifestyle to another lifestyle is a grieving process. Letting go of behaviors and attitudes is a grieving process. And so in life, no matter what happens, we're always in process of grieving. And I find it kind of interesting in our 12-step program that the early founders, when they put the program together, actually use the 12 steps as a process for grieving. You notice how they're set up. It's beautiful. Because I really believe there's such a process to this that it's unbelievable. That's what I want to share with you tonight, because I really want to concentrate tonight on the first three stages of grieving. And then next week, we'll talk about the last two stages, which are sadness and acceptance. You have to understand something to be able to really put this into perspective. There's a war going on inside of every one of us as human beings. I call it the ultimate war. It's the war between the ego and the spirit. Our ego is our intellectual part. And so many of us in the course of our intellect, we kind of find answers. We analyze them. I have a nickname in recovery, I call it 
difference between what I call recovery and what I call intellectual recovery and real recovery. Because basically, we have a tendency to figure things out. But the hardest part about recovery is, how do I make it become real inside of me? We use the term acceptance. And to me, acceptance is the most spiritual word on the face of the earth. And the bottom line is real simple. To come to acceptance is work. You don't just come to acceptance. I can come to acceptance intellectually, but to come to acceptance in my gut, I gotta go through a process of change. I gotta go through feelings. Whenever we experience loss, no matter what the loss is, it's a process that takes time. The normal gr grieving process from any loss, no matter what it is, a relationship, a change of life, no matter what happens, is normally anywhere from about 18 months up to about three years, for some people longer. It's all based on where you're at and based on when you're ready to deal with it. And so many of us have a hard time with this because basically we go through these stages and I don't know about you, you usually go through them kicking and screaming. I have yet to go through them easily. So intellectually, yeah, sure. But to go through them, I gotta feel the pain, feel the feelings. And most of us are afraid of feelings. We shut ourselves down for a long period of time. And now we have to open them up and get in touch with them. That's the key to the whole thing. And so it's a process we go through in life. So the first three stages deal with denial, anger, and bargaining. I joke about it. I'm Italian, I can't help it. <laughs> See, as Italians, we got a disease. It's called un capitosa. In Italian, it's called brickhead, which means I gotta do it the hard way first, beat the crap out of myself, and then finally deal with it. But that's okay. That's how it's supposed to be, because we're human beings. And our humanness is part of who we are. And we always gotta do it the hard way first, and then we come to that gift of acceptance only through struggle and pain, only through the process we have to go through in life. And a big part of this is connected to the first three steps of the program. I've often said when I look at the steps and try to live by the steps, the first three steps take us through those three stages. Steps four through nine take us through the sadness stage. And steps 10 through 12 take us through the acceptance stage. So we're gonna to concentrate today just on that foundation, those basics, those fundamentals. Because to deny something is normal. Most of us don't wanna look at things in our life. Even when things happen, we make all kinds of ways to be able to deal with it. We're human beings. Even when somebody dies. Do you ever notice something? I get a kick out of this, the funerals and stuff that I go to all the time. You know, as an ex-priest and also now as a minister, I have experienced a lot of funerals in my life. Uh, and sometimes, you know, as human beings, we have our ways of coping and our ways of grieving. You go to a wake and people look at the body and they say, doesn't he look good? <laughs> He's dead. But I understand that. And I also understand why they say that. It's part of the grieving process. It's like I really can't accept the fact that he's dead. I can't accept the fact of death. And so very many times I'm able to look at that and say those things, and I say them from my heart. Because intellectually, I'm still dealing with the process of trying to cope with it and deal with it. And it's hard, it's painful. And so I have a lot of things I say, you know, we have a lot of cliches. Well, he's better off. He's been sick. At least he's at peace. These are all things that we say which are normal because, again, it's because deep down inside, we're not ready yet to deal with the feelings that are going on inside of us and how to be able to deal with those feelings and get in touch with those feelings. But it all takes time. It's an effort. And yet it's normal. See, try to understand something. We go through this process of grieving slowly and gradually. I've learned this a long time ago. You know, and you're looking at a very compulsive person here. I learned a long time ago that when you do things slowly and gradually, they stick with you. When you do things on a process and try to do them too quickly, they don't work. And that's why things that are real are things that we have to work through and work on. It's part of the journey of life. 
And so we're going to experience the loss in a lot of different directions. I tell addicts this all the time when I'm working at the rehabs and everything else. I'm used to my addictive personality. I'm used to my addictions. And now you're taking it away from me and wanting me to become this other person. Whoa. You see, I've, I've invested years in this. So what's the big thing that happens to me? I get angry. And I want to give you a, a concept tonight. Anger to me is the healthiest, most powerful, most beautiful emotion there is on the face of this earth. If you process it. If you stuff it, it turns into depression and it can actually destroy you. It's the, it's the, I call it the emotion with the two edged swords. But why do I feel angry? Take the addict. I've put down the, my drugs and my alcohol, and now they give, you give me this thing called recovery, but I'm angry because I want to use. It's part of the grieving process. I'm going through it. And so to be angry at someone that you love who has died, you're angry at them for dying. I never understood this for a long period of my life, that you can actually love someone and be angry at them. And the anger is normal. Take relationships. You've been in a relationship for a long period of time. And basically, you even know intellectually. Here's the intellect again. I know I've got to get out of this thing. It's not working. And I can't wait to get out of it. Once you get out of it, you get angry. Why? Because I invested a good period of my life in the relationship, and it didn't work. That anger is normal. There are things we have to learn to feel and be in touch with. But again, if I feel this anger, I don't process it or share it. That's why I love the beginnings of the first step of the program. Notice that it is the word we, not I. I can't do grieving or grieve alone and by myself. Real grieving process takes place in conjunction with others. I have to be able to share the feelings going on, but many of us are scared of feelings, especially the feeling of anger. You know, I find it interesting in growing up as a kid. I grew up in the 40s. You remember those times, right? Well, where is he? He's back there, okay. You grew up in the 40s. <laughs> my my goomba back there. <laughs> But the beautiful part about it is, it's nice to have people here to understand what I'm talking about. But anyway, back in the 40s, you know, I was taught by some very interesting ladies that I'm not allowed to get angry. And the ones that taught me were the angriest people I ever met. <laughs> it's totally amazing, isn't it? You know, they're telling me not to be angry. I'm not allowed to be angry. I'm not allowed to feel. I'm not allowed to be in touch with feelings. Even in our family systems, a lot of times, what was I taught? I was taught if you truly, truly work on yourself and take care of yourself, you're being selfish. And for a long period of time, I felt guilty about that. What I'm realizing today is I have feelings, and those feelings are things I need to be in touch with. I use the example all the time when I work with families, and I talk about Al-Anon. I grew up in an addictive household. My mother was the addict of my family, and she was, you know, been through a lot of prescription drugs and things of that effect. And I don't know about you, but on occasion, I'd be driving across, I was a priest at the time, I'd be driving across the Ben Franklin Bridge, and I decided if I just open the car door and push her out, <laughs> I just solved the drug problem. That's a simple solution, isn't it? Right, Mom? <laughs> simple solution. Now, that's called a feeling. If I open the door and push her out, I go to jail. <laughs> See how simple it is? But the bottom line is, for years and years and years, I never knew I was allowed to have those feelings. I was allowed to feel things. Because feelings are neither right nor wrong, they're just feelings. And you're allowed to have them. And if any of you have gone through anything in the course of your life, you're going to experience this process. And so anger is a normal process you go through in grieving, because so many of us have invested a lot of time in our life. Let me give you an example on a personal level. I knew, I said this to you plenty of times, I knew 10 years before I left the priesthood, I wanted to leave. Many of my addictions were active while I was in the priesthood. And as a result then, basically, I wanted out. But intellectually, I knew it. Because many of us, especially if you're a good codependent, 
We have a disease called the I know disease. I love it. Don't you see what you're doing? I know. And we keep doing it. It's amazing, isn't it? It's the truth. I call it, we have two big diseases, the I know disease and the spleen disease. We explain everything. We never do anything about it, though. And so I basically understood this, but it took, I say to this day, it took a therapist, it took the recovery community, it took a whole family to help me process that through over this 10 years to finally make that decision. Why? Because basically I was scared to let go of my security blanket, which I was used to, even though I didn't want it, to go into something new and move to a new direction. People experience this a lot of time on jobs. We experience it in relationships a lot of time. It's almost like I'd rather stay with the old than move into the new. Because the new involves work, it involves investment, it involves looking at things in life, but it also involves this process of feelings. That's where the bargaining stage comes in. God, we are such good bargainers. I use the term, we play it with God all the time. Let's make a deal. <laughs> I love it. You know, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. Get me through this situation, and I make the following 93 promises. And after we get through it, we say, we do some plea bargaining. We have to only do two. <laughs> See, we're, we're, we're strange human beings, but you know what? I love it. Thank God we are human. Because deep down inside, we have a lot of feelings going on. A lot of things are happening. And every day, we're going through this process of grieving. The example I use a lot of times is, we, we, every day we grow a day older. I hate to say that out loud, but we grow a day older. <laughs> in fact, I was joking about it today because in a month and a half, or two months actually, I'll be 79, you know? And today we sat down with one of the committees from the board of directors to plan my 80th birthday party. <laughs> They're gonna use it as a fundraiser here. <laughs> I didn't even turn 79 yet, you're planning my 80th birthday party? <laughs> Why don't we work on 85, too? What the hell? <laughs> but you know, I understand all that. I understand the fact that you've got to go through the change process in your life. And if you don't have a sense of humor, you don't have people to help you through it, because you're going to feel pain. I've often said the greatest pain on the face of this earth is the pain of laughter and the pain of growth that goes on at the same time. Sometimes we have to laugh to get through a situation even though it's painful and it's not funny. Some of the greatest things I had to deal with in my life were being able to laugh even when it wasn't funny. It got me through it. But I've also learned something else, to let things happen naturally. There's that second step and that third step in the program. See, the first step says to admit, to admit to the process of what's going on in the course of my life. Well, to me, I can admit but basically, acceptance is something totally different. In the second and third step, I've got to build a sense of faith and a sense of trust. I've got to go on the journey now of realizing the fact that I'm not in charge. You know, one of the things I've learned over the years, one of the scariest things with codependency, anything in life, is we're so scared of losing control. We're scared of change. We're scared of new things. And fear plays a big factor. And only if you have a sense of faith, a sense of trust, that you finally allow, you're able to be open to allow things to go where they're supposed to go. But above all, you've got to understand something. You need to be able to be in touch with your feelings. Your feelings are who you are. I know from my own life and my own concept of life, I stuffed my feelings for a long period of time. In fact, I can honestly say today, 44 years, I didn't realize I had so much stuff buried in there. And what a relief it is to be able to get them out, to talk about them and to share them, and to be able to cry and feel feelings inside of you. We all go through losses every day. I mean, if you don't think you're going through the grieving process, please, you wake up tomorrow morning, go look in the mirror. You're a day older. <laughs> and guess what? Every AM, that's gonna to continue to happen. You can go to the beauty parlor and buy all these, you know, miracle 
and, and what do you call it, vitamins and stuff to this effect, you're still going to get older. Congratulations. Isn't it wonderful? <laughs> but the bottom line is you have to realize the fact that there are things today I can't do that I could do years ago. There are places I can go. You know, when I was in, the early, in my, my earlier years, I would go out around the countryside giving lectures five nights a week. I can't do that anymore. Want to know why? I get tired. It's amazing, isn't it? You know, the sun goes down and I go down. <laughs> Years ago, you know, I could fight that for a long period of time. But I'm realizing it's called change. It's part of the journey. And be able to come to that acceptance takes so much time. Because we're fighters. Come on. And I love that we are. It's all part of it. We lose someone special to us. You know, and guess what? They weren't supposed to leave. What are you doing to me? That's why I love the concept of death. You're going to sound this very strange. I'll talk more about it next week. Death is part of life. Death is a closure. It's a letting go. It's a saying goodbye. And I find this so powerful because I've had the experience so many times of being at the bedside of people as they were getting ready to leave this world. And I learned this very powerfully from the Native American Indians. In the morning, I do my meditations from the Native American Indians, and they understood something that we have a hard time understanding in our culture. And that is the concept between spirit and intellect. See, the Indians even used to do this, the ancient Indians, when they had to kill a buffalo or kill an animal for food, and for clothing. They would actually kneel next to the animal. And because they knew they were letting go of that animal's body and releasing its spirit, they would pray and thank the animal for giving them food and for giving them clothing. And then they would take the spirit of the animal, put it around them, and they wear it. And they acknowledge that that animal is now, that spirit is part of them. And they used to teach that everything in life has forms of spirit. They're interconnected. And so really, once we lose someone, we really don't lose them. Because their energy and their spirit becomes part of us. That's why I really believe in something very deeply today. I really believe that death does not exist. Your body is going to die, yes. But your spirit will never die. Your spirit is the part of you that makes you who you are. Our body gets leaks, what can I tell you? And there comes a point in life where we have to kind of acknowledge them. And after a period of time, your spirit, it, it, it can't stay there anymore. It's got to move on. And what do we do? We fight it. We battle it. But really, in reality, you have to realize the fact that we have to move on to a new dimension in life, too. That's part of the grieving process, too. Even people that are in this world, and they're still connected in a spirit sense to us. And so what do we do? We pass the energy from us on to others. That's called the circle of life. That's why I get so excited about The Lion King, my favorite movie. <laughs> to me, it's a recovery movie. It really is. Because it talks about the circle of life. Everything is that constant process of beginning, ending, and new beginnings and ending. And the circle is unending. And so life is this process of passing it on and being connected to others. And I realize today, all those powerful, beautiful people I've met over the years who have touched my life, who have touched things inside of me, are they gone now physically? Yes. Are they gone spiritually? No. And the spirit is the key to everything we do in the course of our journey. And it's opening that door and allowing that spirit to come through and be able to realize the fact they're still part of your journey today. And yet at the same time, there's sadness involved in that. There's loss involved in that. Because as human beings, we're used to the physical connection between things. Even addicts will tell you this. You may be in re recovery 25 or 30 years. There's still a piece of you that still misses your addiction. There's still a piece. And every once in a while, the sucker comes back to visit and knocks on the door and it says, hey, I'm still here. And therefore, I've got to be able to realize the fact that that's real and that's true. But I've learned something over the years. Faith, 
trust, the second step, will teach me, third step, to let go, to let God, to be open to the process. You know what's the beautiful about it? We're not in charge. The process goes on. It's interconnected. And what's so beautiful about that process is that if we stop fighting it and we stop battling it, it will take place in spite of us. You know what I find so interesting, and I love talking about it, is all of us have been involved in the grieving process since the date of our birth. And that process just continues and it goes on even when we don't even know what's going on. Isn't that wonderful? It's amazing. And yet, that is the process of the journey. It is the process of life. And it continues and goes on no matter what. And so even if we learn to believe, have faith, to trust, to let go, and allow the process of life to take us where we're supposed to go, everything will work. But I've often said this, it'll work in God's time, not in our time. That's what life really is all about. You know, so many of us will go through life unhappy. We go through life sad because we're searching for something. And I try to tell people all the time, stop searching. Of course, if you stop searching, then you will find it. I always love telling the story. My mother in growing up, and I come from a strong Italian family. Growing up as a kid, my mother had this great devotion to a saint, St. Anthony. I should say it the right way, St. Anthony. <laughs> but basically, my mother used to always say sometimes, don't worry about it, St. Anthony will take care of it. And so about three months ago, I lost my car keys. You know, and I went crazy trying to find them. You know how we do this. So I finally said, you know what? I don't know where they are. So I, I remember I, I, my mom played in my head. So I picked up a holy card I have of St. Anthony. And I said, I'll tell you what. I said, Anthony, do me a favor, will you? <laughs> Go find my keys. So I said a prayer. But once I said the prayer, I put the card down, and I stopped looking for my keys. A week and a half later, I was in the garage, and I saw some cardboard that had missed the recycle can. It was laying on the ground. So I got down on my knees to pick up the cardboard. While I was down there, I looked under the car that was in the garage, and there's the keys. <laughs> Apparently, when I got out of the car, I must have dropped them, and they went under the car. You know? I went back in the room, and I said, where's the holy card? <laughs> I said, hey, Anthony, thanks. <laughs> but the secret was, I didn't look for magic. I said a prayer. I gave it. I gave it to someone else. I gave it to the spirit. And then I let go. And once you're able to let go, everything kind of flows. But it comes in time. And that's why the grieving process from any kind of loss takes a long period of time. Because all of us, you know, we're gonna, we're, we go back to those first three stages. We're fighters. And thank God that we are. You know, we've we got to fight. We've got to battle. We have to analyze everything. We've got to figure everything out and make ourselves half nuts. We have to say that question, why, why, why? And then we get mad at God. Why would you make this happen? Boom, boom, back and forth. You know, isn't it wonderful what we do? I love that. It's crazy. And yet it's normal. You know, I love this because... If you raise children, you know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Did you ever notice two or three-year-olds? They love to say, why? <laughs> you know how crazy we are? We answer them. <laughs> and we do it logically. <laughs> and we give them a beautiful, logical answer. When we're done, they say, why? <laughs> and then we get I'm upset. We go through changes. They don't want to know why. They just want to say, why? Because mm -hmm. they understand the connection to something greater than ourselves. They understand that why simply means because it is. Because it is. One of the greatest spiritual terms on the face of this earth is the word supposed to. Why did we experience what we experienced in the course of our journey because we were supposed to? Why did people come into our life at one time or another to be our teachers? Why did they leave? Because they were done teaching, they had to leave. You know, even though we might think they're not done, but guess what? They had to leave, because it was their turn to leave. We have no idea. 
I've said this so many times, I think every one of us has a round trip ticket. And one day the second half's gonna get punched. And there's no timeline on that. Could get punched when you're two years old, or could get punched when you're 102 years old. Or get punched when it's supposed to get punched. So in the meantime, celebrate the moment, celebrate the day, try to look at things through the eyes of gratitude, and realize the fact that certain people came into your life at a certain period of time to be a teacher. And I know you didn't want them to leave, and maybe you did want them to leave, but at the same time, you're still experiencing anger, and we constantly go through that bargaining stage. The bargaining stage I love. I call it the Excedrin stage. <laughs> you know, you have to analyze everything, kind of figure everything out. I love watching addicts a lot of times. I'm not a total addict. I'm only a part-time one. Okay, whatever, I don't know. But I have to battle because maybe I can do this, maybe I can do that, maybe I can go here. I had some, some guy in today, the same thing, he said to me, well, you know, I had a major problem with drugs, never had a problem with alcohol though. <laughs> so now I have a couple drinks, you know, what the heck, you know. And then basically, guess what? He ended up in a rehab with alcoholism now instead of drug addiction. <laughs> I tried to remind him today, I says, uh, I got a book here, it's called The Book of Narcotics. Let's open it up. The first drug listed, alcohol. Oh, it's actually listed in that book. And also on the bottom it says, the toughest of all the drugs. It's amazing, isn't it? The one that does the most damage to your body. You come right down to it. And so, but yet I can show that to him, intellectually talk to him, but you know what? doesn't mean a thing until he's ready to say goodbye, until he's ready to face it, until he's ready to deal with it. And most of us don't want to deal with a lot of stuff. I mean, you know as well as I, and I said it earlier, you know, many of us know exactly what's going on, but can we actually come to a point to be able to accept how things are and be able to live in the present and live in the moment? But see, I've got to do it the hard way first. I have to bargain. I gotta sort it out. I gotta try to figure it out. I have to find the answer. I love, what I love so much about all of us as human beings, we're the only species that tries to find an answer to something that has no answer. Isn't that amazing? It's amazing. The animals don't do it. They go with the flow. They have a connection to one another. The trees, the plants, life around us all knows exactly what it's supposed to do. There's a time for life and a time for death. They, they, they go through the process. We are the only ones who fight it and battle it because we were given this thing. I said this, when I die, I'm gonna tell God, you made a mistake when you created me. There should be an off on switch up here so I can shut it off and break it. This is what gets me in trouble all the time. And so that bargaining stage is something we've got to go through, the anger stage. But you know what? I'm glad we've got to go through it. It's almost like we have to earn the acceptance. We have to work towards it. There's sadness involved in life. There's endings involved in life. There's closure involved in life. There's letting things go. But so many of us don't do closure for a long period of time. That's why I said before, this process I told you this last week. I didn't grieve my father's death or my mother's death till years after they died. My father died when I was 26 years old. I didn't grieve his death till I was 42. So I started to grieve, although I probably was grieving before that, but I was trapped and stuck in that denial bargaining stage. That's why the reading tonight said it so beautifully. We go back and forth. We bounce back and forth. I call it, we have to run the gauntlet. I gotta bounce back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and back and forth until, I love this saying from the program, until I get sick and tired of being sick and tired. And then finally, I may be able to move to the next level. And I can't predict this, I wish I could. People say to me, well, when's it gonna happen? <laughs> I'm not Houdini. If I could predict that, you know, I'd come right out and say it. If I could predict that, guess what? 
I could take you on the road and you know, I can make a million bucks. I can't predict it. I see people go through the grieving process from death or from the end of a relationship. I've seen people hold on to relationships even after they're over for years and years and years and years until finally they had to face it and they had to deal with it. I've seen people, you know, end something in life, even death, that's a big part of it. And so many times it just takes time because many of us are scared of that anger stage. I never knew this, but it really is okay. I'm going to try to say this intellectually. It's okay to be angry at someone that you love. It's okay to be angry when someone leaves you and dies. It's okay to feel the feeling of anger. But please, don't keep it inside. Talk to somebody about it. Process it. If you keep it inside, you know what will happen? It turns into resentment. turns into depression. It eats away at you on the inside. Then after a while, when you actually do get angry, man, you let it go. But I'll tell you a thing about anger. You can't stuff it completely. It'll come out sideways. And what do people do a lot of times? What I'm really angry at, I can't face. So what do I do? I take it out sideways. It's a very interesting statistic, and I love this statistic. It comes from the family court over in Philadelphia. I never realized this. 60% of all the people in domestic violence court are usually first-time offenders. And most of their profiles are. They have a lot of stuff they bury for a long period of time and it comes out sideways, either on their spouse or their kids or somebody else. When really in reality, many of the courts then mandate them to therapy and they find out later on they weren't really angry at their kids or their spouse. They were carrying something deep inside of them for a long period of time they had to deal with. But what's so powerful about anger is if you don't process it, and that's why I've said this over and over again, the real grieving process takes love and support. That's why I love the way the process works, especially when it comes to death. When somebody dies, you notice how the family comes together. And what do we do as a family? We get out old photographs, we start getting stuff together, you know, we work real hard, we sit around, we talk about the person like they're sitting right there. That's part of denial, and that's part of the bargaining, it's part of the process of grieving. I told you last week, that's why when somebody dies in a hospital or a nursing home, they leave the body there and have you come and look at it. So you actually see it. And if you haven't done that, the undertaker a lot of times will take you down and let you look at it and identify the body. The purpose behind that. They're doing that to get you to start the grieving process, to get it started. It's a powerful process with it. You know, and it's, it's a very beautiful thing to be able to experience someone when they're dying and when they know they're dying. I've had the experience so many times in my own journey, and recently I had it again with people that are close friends of mine. I've been able to with them and share with them and actually have them talk to me about what they wanted me to do for the funeral and actually prepare it. See, to me, that is so spiritual, it's unbelievable. It's so unbelievably beautiful because they're actually being able to talk about something they're getting ready for. The ancient Indians, the chiefs of the tribes, when they got old, they knew when it was time for them to go. They would actually go around to the tribe and say goodbye to everybody, then go up to the mountainside and release their spirit and give their spirit because they knew it was time for them to go. And I really believe that because I've been around death a lot a many times right now, and I really know <clears throat> that people basically fundamentally know when it's time. And that's why when somebody dies in an accident or something quickly, they don't have time to do that processing. And so maybe their spirit then has to do it for them. And that's okay too. We've seen things like near-death experiences or people going through different things. You know, that's all part of the process of life. You know, I often remember a good friend of mine when he was on his deathbed at his house and my wife was with him when he died. I'll never forget this because basically he was laying there and his family had just visited him and they had just left. So it was just my wife or, or, or neighbors. And he said to my wife, he said, oh, 
boy's name is Carol. He said, Carol, there's a man at the end of my bed, and he's telling me to come with him. You think I should go? She said, well, my wife said, well, that's up to you, Dominic. He says, you know what? I like the guy. I think I'm going to go. So, see you later. <laughs> Died. Isn't that amazing? He actually knew. Another great experience I went through, another one of my neighbors, and I love this because the lady that went through this always loved telling the stories. I like being around seniors when they tell a lot of stories. And she was at the deathbed of her husband. He was like 91, 92 years old. He was in a coma. And you know how they tell you things that people actually, you can talk to them when they're in comas and they do hear you? I really believe that. But anyway, his family, the doctors took him off the machine and everything, and they said it's time for him to say goodbye to him. So the family gathered around the bed. They prayed. The minister was there. And they're getting ready to say, trying to say goodbye to him. Well, he was supposed to be in a coma. Here's what spirit's all about. His wife told me that right before he died, he popped his head up and he said, bye. <laughs> Put his head. I said, for real? He said, yeah. But see, that wasn't his body doing that. His body had already died. That was his spirit. It decided to use his body as a temple to say goodbye to his family. And then, boom, he died. And it, see, I talk about these things that are so powerful and yet so beautiful at the same time. Because you realize the fact that there's a, this thing inside of us that's so beautiful. It's our spirit that makes us who we are. And I think, unfortunately, in the world that we live in today, we get so caught up in material things. Those, we get so caught up in making sure we have everything. And what's the most important thing in the world? The spirit that's inside of you. There's those first three steps again. I love steps two and steps three because they're about spirit. They're about faith. They're about trust. They're about realizing the fact that you're not in charge. I'm sorry. It's about letting go. It's about turning it over. And most of us now, we turn it over, don't you? Here's the codependence, turning things over. I love it. I love the analogy. Visualize yourself, you know, sitting on a pendulum of a clock. Sitting on the clock. And you grab the pendulum and you hold it this way. And you wonder why the clock's not ticking. <laughs> then they convince you to let go. Here's how codependents let go. They catch you with the other hand. <laughs> <laughs> and it's still not ticking. We're scared to let go because the sucker's going, to, whoa. It may take a while for it to balance out. I use that as an analogy of the grieving process. Many of us want to hold on, which is normal. And letting go is a tough process because it means we have to take time to say goodbye. And closure is scary. And then when we let go, man, you know, just to, you know, there's a part of us, oh, well, oh just a minute, there's a bargaining sale. Let me grab it again, just in case. Let's see, I got the other hand now. Then finally, I got to be able to release it. And I'm going to tell you, this is a process that's so beautiful, so special, so spiritual, yet it takes so much time. And I often say it's in God's time, not our time. People have lost children. Talk to a family today that lost their son to addiction. And she said something so beautiful to me today. This happened a while ago. She lost her son. And she said to me today, she said, I could actually feel my son's presence. And she said, my daughter had a dream. And she dreamt that he came to visit her. So he probably wanted to spend some time with her. And I said, no. Your daughter had a dream because she wanted him to come. She was calling him. So whenever we dream stuff, I do believe that people come to us in our dreams. And that literally it's because we call them and we ask them to come. But they will come when they're ready. And that's okay too. And we see this in very many areas of life. Did you ever have a dream and you go back in history, you go back in time? It's the whole thing. Yeah. That's what happens. And as a result then, you experience it. Your grandma? My grandma. Yeah. yeah. I know. I remember one thing but with my, um, I had this dream three days ago. It was so real, it was unbelievable. And 
I was back in the priesthood again, and I was upset. I couldn't find my vestments. I couldn't find my chalice. I was getting ready to say mass. I couldn't find anything. I was running around like a nut, going crazy and insane. And, go, and I talked to a friend of mine who's a dream interpreter, and he said, every dream you have is about you. And he says, what it sounds like to me is that you, you're scared to lose control. It's true. I am. My wife will tell you, I go to the airport to get on an airplane three and a half hours ahead of time. <laughs> I got to make sure I'm on time. You know, my, grand, my, my, my daughter laughs at me all the time. She says, you came to visit us and you're leaving. I got to get to the airport. <laughs> Because the crazy plane might leave without me. What can I tell you? <laughs> but I've got this thing where I've got to be on time. And yet at the same time, you know, it's, we have a hard time changing things like that. There's so many things in life that we experience and we're taught that we have a hard time letting go of. You know, one of the things I joke about all the time is my mother used to tell me all the time, you know, when it comes to the old, the old school, you know, never fly on an airplane. If God wanted you to fly, God would have given you wings. <laughs> You've all heard that one, you know. And I didn't fly till I was 48 years old. After I got married, my wife got me on a plane. And I was scared to death to walk down that walkway. I figured my mom would be waiting for me at the other end. <laughs> That's real Italian right there. <laughs> but you know, the old tapes play. What can I tell you? You know, you go back and forth with this stuff. And it comes back. You know, go back again. But see, here's the most important thing. Don't be afraid to laugh. Because these things will happen to you back and forth. You're going to go through changes. You know, and I really believe this because a good friend of mine who just died recently used to say things to me. She always used to say, never stop laughing. Laugh at life. You know who I'm talking about. And she basically would tell us over and over again, have fun. And even when she was getting ready to die, guess what? She said the same things to me. I was at her house. And she said, don't stop laughing. It's OK. It's a beautiful thing. You come right down to it. And I see this over and over again in life. I'm so grateful. I have so much gratitude today for this process of life. So what I want to do next week is I want to spend time talking primarily about sadness, death, and acceptance. To me, to come to that stage of our life takes time. But it's a beautiful stage to come to. You can finally feel the sadness and the loss and come to an acceptance or come to peace with it. Come to peace and serenity. You know, and again, it's such a beautiful thing to be able to come to that. And yet I'm going to tell you, it takes work. <laughs> I'm sorry. It takes time. The biggest part is that third step. It takes letting go. Letting go. God, isn't it wonderful? There's so many things in life you're not in charge of. Isn't it great? Mothers know what I'm talking about. <laughs> you know, you have a hard time cutting that cord. <laughs> you know, because... I want things to be okay. And you know these kids, they're a pain in the neck. They never cooperate. <laughs> they're all going to do what they want to do. Isn't that amazing? Mm -hmm. Just like you did. <laughs> Same concept. It's amazing, isn't it? But that's part of it. It's how it's supposed to be. And then we go through grief. We go through all kinds of anxiety. But see, we have a hard time letting go. And so I want to really work on that to finish up this series. And then I will go right into the series on codependency, my favorite series to do. I have a lot of fun with that one. I'll give you a chance to look at things in a positive way. I have two other announcements I just want to make before we close. And I always do something at the end of the 7 o'clock lecture. I do a little prayer service. So I'll let you stick around just for a couple of minutes. At the end of the session, 8 o'clock tonight, we do have meditation class if you want to stay around for it. At the 12 o'clock lecture and the 7 o'clock lecture, after both lectures, we offer a meditation class. You know, uh, so if you're welcome, if you want to do some meditating, feel free to stick around. And also at 8 o'clock tonight, there's a Naranon meeting over in room 29 at the end of this hall. Okay, you're welcome to 
participate in that also if you want to. But let's take a minute. We have a tradition that we have here at Starting Point. You'll notice our memorial wall. We have close to 760 names on the wall. The people have gone through our doors since we opened them in 41 years ago. And so a tradition I started is take a few minutes and be able to just offer a prayer and thank God for the people that have been part of our journey. Because I really do believe that their spirit is in this room. It will always be in this room. That's why this room is very special. It's a place of remembering. It's a place of memorial. So let us pray. God, we come before you as a family. We come here in gratitude. We come here in humility. We thank you in a very special way for all those people who have crossed our path in the course of our journey in life. We thank you and allow us to be able to look at their memories and know that even to this day, they are still teaching us. They're still showing us what life really is all about. Teach us every day to experience and to celebrate that each day we have on the journey. Celebrate the moments of life. But above all, teach us to be grateful for all those who have come into our life to be our teachers, for those who have touched our path. We ask that you allow their spirits to be close to you. And please, the spirit of each and every one of them may now reach out and touch us, be part of us in our journey. We never have to walk alone again. It's such a comfort and such a beauty. We are connected to all people in life. So we pray and we ask this every day. And we thank God. We pray this in your name. Amen. We have a way to be closed. Can we just join hands and we'll say the serenity prayer? Now I've got to get unwired. Yeah. Just push the little button in the back.